Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. In the morning, Olala rushed through the underpass to work, as usual. She was four months pregnant. Thank God, she had no morning sickness, so she was able to work. She was terribly sleepy and could barely get out of bed in the morning, but then she realized that she was going to be late and started bustling like mad. The underpass was crowded and noisy, as usual. The usual vagrants were standing at the exit. Olala could not pass them indifferently. She felt sorry for those poor people and bought them tea and a bun whenever she could. They sincerely thanked her each time. The local flower vendors next door told that Olala is crazy. I can tell by her clothes that she is not rich, moreover she is pregnant, but she feeds these bums. Anyone can stand and ask for alms. Try to get a job and earn some money. Work from dawn till dusk. She also gives them money, they will drink it all anyway. They didn't know that Olal understood these people like no one else and knew how painful it was to be homeless, hungry, and miserable. Yes, she understood that many of them drink a lot, but it is only out of despair and cold because they stand in the draft all day long and watch passers by rush, hurrying to work or home, and someone is waiting for them at home, someone think about them. But no one and nowhere is waiting for homeless people. They are all alone in this big scary world. And so is she. Olala waved to the homeless people, as always, and suddenly noticed a newcomer among them. It was a young guy, in his thirties, with curly, long messy hair, with crutches. He just stood there in silence, staring off into the distance. A cap was lying beside him, and the passers-by were throwing change into it. For some reason, she felt so unbearably sorry for him. My God, I dare to complain about life, while this guy has no leg and still goes on living. In a burst of emotions, she bought a donut with jam and a cup of hot tea and handed it to him. Please take it, bon appetit. The guy was terribly embarrassed and looked at her with such gratitude. Thank you, he looked down and blushed. Olala waved him off and walked away, so as not to embarrass the boy. Heavy memories of her childhood came over her. She didn't remember much about her so-called family. Her mother drank all the time, fighting and cursing. Her stomach was always in pain from hunger, but whenever the little girl started crying and begging for food, instead of dinner she got only blows and slaps. The house was always dirty, full of empty bottles of surrogate alcohol. Sometimes the girl found leftovers of a drunken feast on the sticky table and greedily ate them while no one was watching. The horrible stench of a mixture of alcohol, cheap cigarettes, and unwashed bodies stuck forever in her memory. Olala was taken to the orphanage because of a complaint from Laura, a kind-hearted neighbor. The woman could not ignore the nightmare Olala was growing up in. The girl often wandered alone in the street until late at night, despite the fact that she was only five years old. No one ever looked for her, never called her home. Laura often fed the scruffy little girl and cried when she watched her greedily eating the pie she gave her. When the girl was six, it became clear that no one was going to send her to school. The alcoholic mother did not care where her daughter was or what happened to her. Her maternal instinct had atrophied, or maybe she never had any maternal instinct at all. So Laura made up her mind, called the social authorities, and told them how hard life was for this unfortunate child. When Alala was taken to the orphanage, she cried, screamed, and called for her mother. But the mother slept after another night out and didn't notice what was going on. The child had a wild tantrum when she was given a boy's haircut, washed, and dressed in an orphanage uniform, although it was clean. And the monotonous, gray everyday life went on. The orphanage life was not easy for her, the food was not good, the behavior and discipline of the children were strictly monitored, and they always punished children for disobedience. But at least they didn't beat them as it happened at home. Relatives visited some of the girls and brought them toys, sweets, and birthday presents. Olala was always very jealous of them because only once Laura came to her and brought her a bag of cheap sweets. The good-for-nothing mother never visited her daughter in the orphanage. Olala carried this resentment and bitterness through her entire childhood and vowed to herself that she would never abandon her own baby, no matter what. 
She did well at school, especially in math and science, and she was able to count in her head easily. After leaving the orphanage, Olalo was given a room in a dormitory by the government. The conditions there were awful. The floors were rotten, the windows should have been replaced long ago, there were pieces of torn wallpaper on the walls, and a shabby couch stood modestly in the corner. Together with her friend Ironita, Olala decided to try to enroll in college, though she had no illusions about it. And to her surprise, she was accepted at the first attempt. Thanks to her excellent knowledge and mathematical skills, the girl couldn't be happier. She, a girl from an orphanage, without any connections or money, entered the economics department of a prestigious college. She moved into a nice room with two girls from well-to-do families. Abel and Barbara were quite frivolous girls, and studying was a burden to them. They often skipped classes and liked to party late into the night. Olala, on the other hand, devoted all her time to her studies and spent her free time in the library. The girls often teased her. Olala, are you crazy? It's springtime, it's warm. There are parties every day, and you're like an old woman spending all your evenings with books. Come on, take a break, and have some fun with us for once. But the girl was just waving it off. No, girls, I can't, I have exams coming up, and I have no one to help me if anything. So I have to rely only on myself. Barbara laughed. Well, if that's the case, will you let me copy your homework as a friend? Because I won't have time to do my homework, I'm going to a party. Eventually, all Alala's efforts were rewarded, and she passed her exams early and finished her first year with honors. Barbara and Abel miraculously avoided being expelled and were angry at Olala. That nerd was just lucky. You and I are no worse. Aren't we, Barbara? Abel was getting furious. Then the two friends decided to make fun of Olala. During the summer break, almost all the students had left the dormitory, and it was completely empty. Olala was sad and lonely, but she had nowhere and no one to go to. There was nothing left but to continue to go to the library and study. That's when Barbara and Abel showed up on the doorstep and said, Olala, we invite you to a barbecue. There will be the guys from the final year, a barbecue, and the river. Don't tell me you have to study. That's ridiculous. It's spring break right now. She was pleasantly surprised at the suggestion. Because they were not friends and did not communicate much, they were too different by nature. But she really wanted to relax after a hard study and at least have some fun with someone. And she happily agreed. Why would she stay in the library? The warm spring sun was shining, the weather was perfect, the plan was cunning, everyone knew that Olala didn't drink, didn't smoke, and was a little weird. So they decided to get her drunk and make fun of the excellent student. That very picnic turned her life upside down. From the very beginning, everything went wrong. Olala imagined a warm, friendly company, positive and relaxing day. But when they arrived at Barbara's summer house, she saw a completely different picture. In the gazebo, there were a lot of adult guys, rich guys, from rich families, and the same glamorous relaxed girls. The party was booming. Cocktails and champagne, dancing, and loud music. Olala felt like a black sheep, uncomfortable and unable to relax. Barbara and Abel talked a lot about fancy clothes and fancy parties and quietly poured martinis into her juice glass. Olala had never drank alcohol, so she got drunk quickly, felt bad, and tried to get up, but her feet refused to move, and she stumbled and fell, sprawled out on the grass. Immediately, everyone started laughing wildly. Instead of helping her, Barbara shouted loudly, Look at that! Our diligent honor student got drunk. Still waters run deep. And you pretended to be a modest shy girl, I almost believed you. The girl awkwardly stood up and felt bitter and resentful. Of all the laughing crowd, only one guy reached out his hand and tried to help her up. Tears came to her eyes, and she just walked away from this place. She looked around, looked at Barbara and Abel, and shouted, Fuck you all. The girl didn't know where to go or how to get home. The summer house was outside the city, and the terrain was completely unfamiliar. 
She walked along the dusty road and cried profusely. Her bruised knee hurt, and the girl scolded herself. Why did I come here? What was I hoping for? That they would treat me like I am one of them? What I was thinking about? I am just an orphan. No one needs me. Suddenly a car pulled up behind her and someone called out to her. Balala, wait. Get in. I'll take you to the dormitory. I'm Daniel. I'm a final year student. The girl stopped and looked incredulously at the handsome, athletic guy. He was the one who had tried to help her. She wanted to refuse, but she looked into his honest, kind eyes and something about him evoked trust. She wiped away her tears and got into the car in silence. I can't walk home alone anyway. The guy reassured her the whole way. Don't be angry, they're just drunk and stupid. Without their wealthy parents, they're nothing. And you're great. You're strong and brave. I know you're a straight A student and I like you a lot. You're different, you're real. The girl said angrily, Dash, come on. I'm not your equal. I'm just an orphan. I don't have a rich daddy who will solve all my problems and give me everything I need. And you're one of them, aren't you? What do you want from me? I don't trust anybody. The boy put his hand quietly on her shoulder. You can trust me. And suddenly he kissed her on the cheek. That burning, defiant kiss made the ground fall from under her feet. Her heart raced and her feet felt padded. She had never felt this way about anyone before. She suddenly felt so good and relaxed. From that day on she couldn't get Daniel out of her mind. She couldn't concentrate on her studies at all. As soon as she remembered the touch of his lips, the smell of expensive perfume, a wave of tenderness and passion came over her with renewed strength. Before her eyes flashed his muscular shoulders and radiant kind smile. The girl was angry with herself. What the hell is wrong with me? A rich guy gave me a ride, out of pity. Get him out of your head, Olala. You're not right for him. He probably already forgot about me. When Daniel found her in the college dorm and asked her out, Olala immediately said yes. It took her a long time to get her makeup done. After all, it was the first date she had ever been on. She was scared and anxious, but at the same time, the anticipation of the impending meeting with Daniel gave her confidence. She was nervous. How should I behave with him? What to say? What if he thought I was just a boring nerd and didn't want to see me again? He is from a wealthy family, visited a lot of places, very erudite and open-minded. But me. But everything went just fine. After half an hour, the nervousness of the first meeting was gone and they were relaxed. Daniel turned out to be quite simple, with no arrogance at all. And the way he looked at her. He called her his sweetheart, his smart girl and gave her delicate roses. The couple walked through the night city, kissed passionately, and could not separate from each other even for a second. They fell in love despite everything. No one, absolutely no one believed it would work. Angry and jealous girls whispered behind their backs. What did he see in that ugly girl? There is nothing special about her. It's okay, love will come to an end and Daniel will leave her. He probably had a lot of girls like that. Daniel's parents were businessmen, respected and powerful people. When they found out about their meetings, there was a huge scandal. The mother yelled, what are you doing, son? Why do you need this orphan girl? Your father and I have already chosen a girl for you from our social circle. A deputy's daughter, a beauty. What do you see in this Olala? Daniel was shocked by the cynicism of his parents and shouted back, Dash, how can you not understand? I love her. And I will be with her, whether you like it or not. It's my choice and my life, and it's up to me to decide what to do with my life. Then his father banged on the table. Oh, really? Are you going to go against your parents' will? Then go and earn your own money for you and your girlfriend. I won't give you a penny anymore. You haven't worked a day. You're used to living at my expense. Let's see what you can do without my money. But Daniel was determined not to give up his love. He packed his bags and left his parents' mansion. 
Benedicta, Daniel's mother, yelled at her husband in tears. Salomon, why are you so harsh? What if Daniel left forever? What if he's not going to come back home? The man smirked. Calm down. He'll be back in a month. He's not going anywhere. He's a student. He hasn't worked anywhere for a day. It won't take him long to realize there's no money. It will be a good lesson for him. The couple began to live in Olala's room. It was very difficult for Daniel to adapt to such harsh conditions after a luxurious life. He had to get a job as a cab driver. He tried hard and worked really hard. All for his beloved Olala. When Daniel gently touched her and whispered words of love in her ear, the girl melted and tried to give her fiancé even more love and affection. She pressed her whole body against her beloved and thanked heaven. No one had ever loved her like that. They did not notice neither the old sofa nor the creaky floors. They had almost no money, but they were happy together, and everything else was not important. On that fateful morning, Daniel had to return from his night shift. Olala had made Daniel's favorite pasta and was joyfully fussing in the kitchen. An hour passed, and he still wasn't there. At first, the girl reassured herself, It's okay, maybe he stayed late at work or met someone on the way home. Alarm gradually increased in her soul, then panic. When the phone rang, something rumbled inside with a bad feeling. A strange, cold voice informed her that Daniel died in a car accident. Her hands shook, her feet faltered, her mind went dark, and she collapsed to the floor without feeling. All the events that followed were as if in a fog, the funeral, the pain, and the terrible, unrelieved grief. Right at the cemetery, Daniel's mother, seeing Olala, through a terrible tantrum, she howled and screamed, Damn you, orphanage snake! It's all your fault! My boy is gone now because of you. Get out of my sight. How dare you come here? But Alala didn't hear her and didn't react at all. She just stood there, unable to move, and cried silently. The next college year began, and Olala, like a robot, visited all the lectures, went to the library, returned to her room, locked the door, and cried. She screamed, My God! Why? Why did you punish me this way? Why did you take away the only person I ever loved? She was lying down on the couch, clutching Daniel's shirt to herself, greedily inhaling his scent, sobbing endlessly. Olala thought of his sensual lips and the strong, gentle arms that embraced her every day. She felt as if the door were about to open and Daniel would come in and say, Hello, my love. I'm home. But the days dragged on slowly, and he was still gone. She refused to accept that it was forever. Olala almost didn't eat, she lost a lot of weight, and she began to vomit in the morning. When she finally figured out what was wrong and decided to take a test, her worst guesses were confirmed, two lines, she was pregnant. All her feelings were mixed, her thoughts confused. What a blessing, I will have a baby with my beloved, with the meaning of life. The baby of the only person I have ever loved, she thought. And then panic started to set in. But how can I raise him alone? Where am I going to get the money now? I won't even be able to work for a long time. What about school? Will I be able to cope? In a burst of emotion, she went to Daniel's parents' house and told them everything honestly. I still love Daniel. I feel so bad. And I'm pregnant. You're going to have a grandchild. But I'm so scared to be alone with a baby. What should I do? She hoped that upon hearing the news that they were going to have a grandchild, they would feel something different towards her, would be happy, and help her in some way. But Alala was wrong. She was humiliated, insulted, and kicked out of the house with the words, Dash, get out of here, slut. You got pregnant by someone else, and expect us to support someone else's child. You'll get nothing from us. And don't even try to blackmail us or ask for money. You won't get a penny. All orphans are sneaky, and you are no exception. You thought that because we lost our son, we would believe any nonsense out of grief? What a rascal. Olalo was walking home, sobbing, and was furious. Is that even possible? They don't want their grandchild. 
Then I'll go to the hospital and solve the problem, she thought angrily. When Alala went to the hospital the next day, she was very worried. The gynecologist was an elderly stern woman. When she heard that the patient had decided to get rid of the baby, she tiredly took her glasses off and wanted to refer her to take the tests before the abortion. But years of work have made the doctor a good psychologist, and she could tell unmistakably what the woman's intentions really were. But looking at this crying, frightened silly girl, she suddenly softened. It was obvious that the girl was just confused, caught in a whirlpool of problems, and dared to commit this sin out of despair and hopelessness. The gynecologist was quiet for a while, she thought, picked up the right words, and said, Listen, my dear, you're still very young, inexperienced, and do not know anything about life. Believe me, if you get rid of the baby, you'll regret it all your life. I know lots of examples of people who want to have a baby after an abortion, but it's too late. I can see that you have a lot of problems, that's why you decided to take this step. But just think about the fact that this baby already exists, alive, feels everything, the baby is a joy and happiness. And you can always overcome difficulties if you do not lose heart. Do not make an irreparable mistake, you will regret it later. Think twice about what I said. Olala suddenly burst into tears and ran out of the room. She scolded herself with the last words. What kind of mother am I? I swore that I would never give up my baby. Am I any better than my alcoholic mother? No. I'll do everything possible, but I'll withstand. I'll raise my baby. That night she dreamt of Daniel. He was stroking her head, sitting on the edge of the bed, whispering, Olala, my love, you're strong, you'll make it, and everything will be all right. I'm always here to help you, my little girl. Olala woke up abruptly and began to touch the bed, trying to find Daniel there. The dream was so realistic. But the room was empty and silent, only the clock ticking above her head. She realized she was doing the right thing. Daniel had blessed her. From that day on, Olala pulled herself together and began to learn how to survive. She took a year off from college and started looking for a job. She had to save some money for childbirth and for the baby. With great difficulty, she managed to get a job at a company as a janitor. Her boss did not like her and was always criticizing and scolding her. Dash, look how much dust you left in the corner. Do you think that if you're pregnant, you can work poorly? Come on, clean it all up. Olala was patient, silent, and worked hard, saving every penny, because now she had a goal for her baby. He was already beginning to move and push, and in those moments she felt so happy. The woman stroked her belly and talked to it, smiling to herself. Despite her difficult financial situation, she managed to find some change from every paycheck and fed the poor people in the underpass. She felt compassion for them and just could not walk by indifferently. Today she was walking home, and she saw the guy on crutches again. She did not understand what it was about him, but once again she gave him a cup of hot tea with a muffin and put a couple of bills in his cap. The guy felt terribly embarrassed as the first time and shyly looked away, muttering, Thank you very much. The woman smiled and was about to walk away when suddenly she heard scolding and shouting. She turned around and saw other homeless people taking the guy's money and yelling that he had been given a lot for nothing. A scuffle broke out and three well-dressed men in leather jackets ran up to the homeless people and began kicking the poor guy as hard as they could. He cowered his head with his arms and tried to dodge, but all in vain. Not realizing what she was doing, Olala rushed straight into the fight. She bravely hit the attackers with the bag and shouted, Stop it! What are you doing? It's a human being. You're going to kill him. I'll call the police. The bum stopped hitting the guy and yelled at Olala, What the hell do you want, stupid? You are pregnant, so get out of here before you get hurt. And this bastard's gonna work for us now. He's a lucky guy. People give him a lot of money. Olala gasped with indignation. Is he a slave? His life is already ruined. Why are you bothering him? He didn't even approach you. Leave him alone. The Trinity laughed in unison. Why are you defending him? Did you like this cripple? 
Then you can take him with you. But first, you have to buy him out. Do you have 10,000? The bum spat right under Olala's feet and left. The woman rushed to the guy, gave him a handkerchief to clean himself up, helped him to stand up, and offered, Come with me to the cafe, I'll buy you lunch. How badly did they hurt you? The homeless man looked at her with such tenderness and gratitude that she even got goosebumps. But then he turned his head, Thank you, but I can't leave this place. Olala felt a little offended. I did it from the bottom of my heart, and he and she walked away. On the way out, she was caught up by a homeless guy she knew. You're brave. Not afraid to protect the newcomer. Don't be offended. He's kind of weird. He keeps quiet all the time and doesn't say anything about himself. We don't even know his name. He's like a mute. All night long and in the morning, Olala could not get this guy on crutches out of her head. His look, his smile, his deep blue eyes. Once again, it was like an electric shock went through her body. If you fall in love with a bum, you'll be crazy. Think about the baby, Olala scolded herself and tried hard to get the guy out of her head. She had not yet entered the underpass, but her heart was already beating frantically in anticipation of meeting the mysterious homeless man. What a disaster. Again? What's happening to me? Olala didn't understand herself. But today the guy just surprised her. He silently gave her a small rose, delicate, white, and amazingly beautiful. And he embarrassingly said, I was waiting for you. I was afraid you wouldn't come. This is for you. Olala blushed and felt embarrassed. She was so pleased by this. Now every morning they crossed paths, talked a little about this and that, but the main thing was the way he looked at her. She knew that kind of look. Only her beloved Daniel looked at her that way. Olala had no idea what was happening to her. She could barely wait to see him again. All her thoughts were of him. Inside she was filled with warmth, as if butterflies began to flutter in her stomach. Even the baby was quiet and stopped kicking. She was angry at herself. God, what is this nonsense? This is just some kind of obsession. I need to pull myself together and stop thinking about him. I'm pregnant by another man, and this guy is a bum and he's disabled. Why do I even want all of this? And he doesn't need it either. But no matter how many times Olala repeated it to herself, every time when she approached the underpass, her heart skipped a beat. These strange encounters lasted a week. One day, joyfully entering the underpass, Olala looked at the place where her mysterious friend was always standing. But he was not there. She turned her head a hundred times in a daze, and tears began to drip down her cheeks. How could it be? Where had he gone? What a fool you are, Olala. What did you want? To have him, like a faithful knight, waiting for you here forever? That's it, the good fairy tale is over. The woman felt so bitter and resentful, her mood completely ruined, she could hardly pull herself together and gloomily walked to her hateful work. Immediately everything around her became gray, the sky became gloomy, and life became hard and hopeless. She struggled through her shift and walked home to an empty room where no one was waiting for her. Suddenly, right at the intersection, the woman saw a police squad arresting the very thugs who had beaten the guy in the underpass. A young lieutenant was the commander. She looked closely and gasped. It was the lame bum from the underpass. Her mysterious and enigmatic knight. Only he wasn't lame and he wasn't curly at all. But a slender and athletic tall blonde man with a short haircut. But his eyes. It was those same deep blue eyes. It's definitely him, there can be no doubt. What a twist. Olala didn't notice that she had been standing there for 10 minutes with her mouth open and her eyes round, unable to move. When the lieutenant saw her, he rejoiced and approached her. Embarrassed, he began, Hello. I'm sorry about that. But I was on a special operation and simply couldn't tell anything about myself. It's my job. My real name is Ignacio. Are you mad at me? Tell me honestly. Olala just caught the air in her mouth, unable to say a word. She was completely confused, 
and the words stuck in her throat. Ignacio suddenly took her hand and said softly, I have to run now, but let's meet tomorrow at our underpass. I ask you out on a date. We have a lot to talk about. Will you come? Olala glowed and nodded. The boy continued to supervise the arrest, and Olala rushed home as if on wings. She kept scolding herself all the way. Damn it. Don't you dare. What about Daniel? What kind of date could there be? Are you out of your mind? There's no way he could just fall in love with me. I'm pregnant. It's unrealistic. I have to stop this whole thing. I'll probably come to this meeting just once. Just to talk and explain everything to him. All the next day, Olala was not herself. She thought a hundred times whether she should go or not. Eventually, at the appointed time, she came to the underpass. Ignacio wasn't there. Olala became angry. Here we go again. He showed up and asked me out, then disappeared. What the hell? He's like a damn mysterious wanderer. She was about to leave when she saw Ignacio running toward her. He was holding a lovely bouquet of wildflowers and waving his hands cheerfully. Olala frowned. Actually, it's the girls who are late for a date. And we have the opposite situation, she muttered resentfully. The boy blushed and began to make excuses. Hello, Olala. I am so sorry, but it's not my fault. The meeting with the chief lasted longer than I expected. I couldn't just leave. This damn job always ruins my personal life, he gibbered. The woman sensed he wasn't lying and instantly forgot about her resentment. She asked, so where shall we go? Or are we just going to stay in this underpass, out of habit? Ignacio blushed again. Let's go for a walk in the park. The weather is really nice. My paycheck is only next week and I'm completely out of money, so I can't invite you to a restaurant. You know what our salaries are. But I promised delicious ice cream and a lot of fun, he said honestly. Olalo was not upset at all. On the contrary, she liked the fact that he was so honest and open about it. She did not want to go to any restaurant, and it would be good for her and the baby to take a walk and get some fresh air. They walked slowly through the alleys and talked. Olala asked, Tell me a little about yourself, because you're like a mysterious Mr. X. I don't know anything about you. Ignacio sighed, There's nothing to tell. I was married, and now I'm divorced. My wife left me for a rich businessman, she cheated on me. At first, I thought I would lose my mind. I felt so sick and did not want to live. So I joined this special operation, despite the risk I had nothing to lose. I loved my wife very much, I never hurt her. But what could I give her? A 13 meter room and a life from paycheck to paycheck. But she wanted to travel to Europe. She kept asking for gold earrings. She kept telling me that I have to take bribes or go into business. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't explain to her that it wasn't my thing. I really love my job, although it is difficult and sometimes very dangerous, I do not want to quit. But alas, it is not compatible with my personal life. How many women would be willing to wait for their husbands from the eternal ambushes and urgent missions? Olala said thoughtfully, I don't know. I think if you love someone, you can survive anything together. I also loved my fiancé very much, and he loved me too. He went against his parents for me. He gave up his wealth. We were very happy. We wanted to get married. The woman suddenly stopped talking. Ignacio said quietly, And what happened? Did he fall out of love and leave you? Why are you alone now? Olala sat down on the bench, took a deep breath, and spoke. No. He died. He died in an accident. I'd give anything in the world to have him back. Daniel was the best. After he died, I found out I was pregnant. I told his parents I thought they'd be happy. Alas, they humiliated me and kicked me out. That's my sad fate. I don't know what to do next. I found a temporary job for now, but then... The guy was shocked. What about your parents? Didn't they support you? My father helped me a lot after my divorce with kind words and good advice. 
Olalov became even sadder. I'm an orphan. I have no one. Or rather, my biological parents exist somewhere, but they don't care about me. I was taken to the orphanage when I was five. My mother drank heavily, and she never came to see me. And you know, I swore that I would never abandon my baby and give him everything he needs. Oh, why am I telling you all this? You don't have to worry about my problems. I'm sorry. Olala said. Ignacio took her hand and said softly, Dash, you are not alone now. Remember this. I know you miss your husband, you still love him, and I don't want to make your life more difficult now. Let's just be friends, okay? I really liked you. I won't hide it. I certainly didn't think I'd fall in love with a stranger when I started that special operation. But it happened, so don't push me away. Just let me be there for you and help you. Just like that, from the bottom of my heart. Olala and Ignacio became best friends. They trusted each other and shared their sorrows and joys. The woman could not believe that she finally had a soulmate, someone who would always listen to her, would not judge her, and would support and help. But she did not even think about intimacy with Ignacio. Although, frankly, she liked him madly, and she realized that these feelings had nothing to do with friendship. Her heart fluttered every time he touched her casually. But she stubbornly pushed the thoughts away, deliberately hiding this feeling to the farthest corner of her soul. She often thought about Ignacio at night, remembered Daniel, and compared her feelings and sensations. I shouldn't love him. It's not right. Because I am betraying Daniel. What am I going to tell my baby? Your daddy died, and I immediately fell in love with someone else. And why would Ignacio want someone else's baby? He'll get scared of responsibility and run away. And then I will suffer. But she could not deceive herself. Her whole being was attracted to Ignacio. She wanted him so badly that only a tremendous effort of will could help her to control herself. Ignacio didn't seem to notice any of this and became Olala's guardian angel. He was always there, helping to carry heavy bags, massaging her swollen legs and lower back, helping to fill out documents, and secretly putting money in her purse and food in the fridge. He always chose only the healthiest foods, fruits, and vegetables. And at night, he would grind his teeth and growl into his pillow. God, why am I such an indecisive fool? I accepted the role of her friend. But I love this funny girl with a belly as big as a watermelon. I love her more than life. Doesn't she see that? Doesn't she feel anything? I'm sure she has feelings for me. Then why is she torturing me? Maybe I should just propose to her. What if I push her away? She still longs for her husband. Then Olala would stop letting me into her life. In this case, I'll go crazy. These thoughts constantly tormented the guy and drove him crazy. He often thought back to the moment when he first saw her in that underpass. A sweet, snub-nosed little girl approached him, happily offering him tea and a donut. Knowing that he was homeless, lame, and miserable, he could not believe that there were such selfless people in this cruel world, people capable of compassion and help. And when he looked closely and noticed her big belly under her blouse, he was amazed. She's pregnant, and she's obviously not rich, but she's still willing to spend money just to help the homeless. Her playful laughter, her thick lashes, and the turn of her head stuck in his heart at first sight. When suddenly in the middle of the night Olala's water broke and she felt severe abdominal pain, she was frightened to death, and out of habit she immediately dialed Ignacio. Ignacio, sorry to wake you. I think I'm in labor. What should I do? I'm so scared. The guy answered calmly. Don't panic. I'm calling an ambulance and I'm on my way to you. Everything will be fine. I'm here for you. And immediately Olala felt better. Ignacio walked back and forth along the hospital hallway, waiting for the news, but two hours had passed and the doctor did not come out. Finally, the door opened, and a worried nurse ran out. She shouted, Are you the husband? Ignacio did not hesitate to answer, Yes, what happened to her? The girl said, 
She turned out to have a very large fetus, and she needed emergency surgery. The woman has lost a lot of blood and is in intensive care. A transfusion is needed immediately. What blood type are you? The scared guy said, be positive. The nurse was relieved. Great. Would you be willing to donate blood for your wife? Ignacio quickly replied, what kind of question is that? Of course. As long as she gets better. Olala woke up in the ICU and wanted to get up, but a sharp pain in her lower abdomen pierced her body. She even cried out. A nurse ran up to her. Don't get up so sharply, you can't stand up yet. The stitches might come apart. Olala turned her head, and not finding the baby next to her, she screamed in panic. What's wrong with me? Where is my baby? Why isn't he with me? Is he alive? The nurse reassured her, don't worry. You have a boy, four kilos, 200 grams. We had to perform surgery and your husband agreed to be a donor. In fact, he saved both of your lives. The worst part is over. You're going to be fine. Don't worry. Olala was shocked. Wow. Ignacio saved her life without hesitation. So, was he really in love with her? She was immensely grateful to him for everything. And yet, she lay there thinking, Daniel, I know you can see and know everything. We have a little boy. I'm going to name him Eduardo. Like your dear grandfather, whom you told me so much about and loved so much. Congratulations, my darling. The nurse brought the baby and handed him to Olala. You can hold your little boy. When she picked up her rosy-cheeked, plump baby, an avalanche of happiness and tenderness came over her. It was a different kind of love, blind, boundless, and all-consuming. Olala was breastfeeding Eduardo, and he was eating funny, and it amused the young mother. Then she kissed his nose, his tiny fingers, and the tears rolled down her cheeks from bliss and happiness. Only now the words of the wise gynecologist, who had talked her out of a fatal and irreparable mistake, reached her in full measure. She could never forgive herself for such a sin. Olala whispered in the baby's ear, My darling son, I'm so happy to have you. A week later Ignacio came to pick up Olala with flowers and balloons. For some reason he was terribly nervous and anxious, shifting from foot to foot. The nurse shouted at him, Dash, why are you frozen? Daddy, come on, take your son. Your son is very strong, very much like you, and she handed the baby directly into the hands of the guy. Olala felt uncomfortable and tried to say, You don't understand, he's not. But suddenly she was silent when she saw him carefully holding the baby and walking proudly with him down the street. The first month was not easy for both of them. Olala was a first-time mother, and Ignacio had no experience with babies either. Feeding, bottles, scheduled walks with the baby, laundry, diapers, and undies. Eduardo's stomach hurt all the time and he could cry all night long. His mom had a terrible lack of sleep and was like a robot because she was going crazy with her son's constant crying. She did not understand what was wrong with him. She cradled him and hugged him, but nothing helped. Ignacio's mom came to the rescue. When she heard from her son what was going on, she immediately understood what it was all about. How could you guys not see what was going on? The baby is big, and probably there is not enough milk. He is hungry, that's why he is crying all the time. Olala, it's time to add extra baby formula, it should help. And indeed, Eduardo was sleeping better and became a little calmer after a more nourishing meal. Ignacio helped her as much as he could, let her nap for a couple of hours in the afternoon and walked in the park with the baby during that time, went to the pharmacy when needed. Together they bathed Eduardo for the first time, both of them had trembling hands. Olala was afraid that the water was too hot, that the baby would swallow it, or even worse, that he would drown, she panicked a lot. But Ignacio confidently held Eduardo and calmed the young inexperienced mother, even though he was no less afraid. Six months flew by like that. Ignacio had become so attached to Olala and Eduardo that he could no longer imagine life without them. He learned to take care of him, to play with him, to cradle him, and did it with great pleasure. 
Alala couldn't imagine even a day without Ignacio either. He had become part of her and Eduardo's family. How many times she thought, my God, I wouldn't have been able to do it by myself. It's so good to have Ignacio around. But they never dared to confess their feelings openly to each other. Everything was in a strange condition. The burning glances, the half hints, and the smoldering spark between them had reached its peak. Olalo was tormented by conscience. What should she do? Often at night, she would turn to Daniel in her mind. Darling, what should I do? I loved you very much, you know that. And I remember you, I long for you. But Eduardo needs a father. And Ignacio really loves me, I can feel it. And I probably love him too. He's very good, trustworthy, you know? But I just feel like I'm betraying you. What should I do? But everything was decided by chance. One day Ignacio came home from his shift and the first thing he did was run to Eduardo. He was sitting in the playpen, babbling something in his baby language, playing with a colorful rattle. Ignacio, trying not to frighten the child with his voice, said as gently as possible, Where is our little Eduardo? Look what I brought. What a funny green frog. Do you like it? Suddenly the baby turned to Ignacio, held out his hands, and distinctly babbled, Did the daddy, smiling with a toothless mouth. Olala was stunned. This is just impossible. He couldn't even pronounce mom yet. And then several times in a row he distinctly said daddy. The happy man was touched to tears. He picked up the toddler in his arms, held him close to him, and whispered, my dear son. Ignacio helped Olala put the baby to sleep and then said, Dash, I'm going out for a while. Don't be bored, I will be back soon. Olala got worried, Ignacio, where are you going? Did something happen? He said nothing, gave her a friendly kiss on the cheek, and left. Olala waited for him for an hour and fell asleep. Suddenly someone touched her shoulder. Olala woke up and rubbed her eyes in bewilderment. Ignacio was standing in front of her on one knee. In his hand he held some kind of box and a bouquet of gorgeous roses. Olala, marry me. I can't take it anymore. I love you and Eduardo very much and I will be the best husband and father. Don't push me away anymore. I'm not made of iron. After all, I feel that you have feelings for me, too. Every time I look at you, I can't help but suffocate with desire. I know how much you love Daniel, but you can't bring him back. I think he'd be glad to know that his family is well protected. Stop torturing me and yourself. Do you agree? You have five minutes to think about it. If you say no, I understand and I'll never bother you again. You have to decide right now. I can't wait anymore. Instead of answering, Olala leaned toward Ignacio and kissed him passionately on the lips. At that moment, there was not just a spark between them, but a fire of passion and desire. Ignacio carried Olala in his arms to the bedroom and began to kiss every millimeter of her body, bringing his beloved to the peak of pleasure. He wanted to savor this moment for as long as possible. He whispered to her in a burst of passion. My darling, my darling, I feel so good with you. She hugged him so tightly, almost dissolving into him, as if she were afraid that this happiness would disappear at any second. It had been a long time since both of them had experienced such intense passion and peak pleasure. Later, after their heavenly pleasure, they rested on the bed under the light of the moon. Olala rested her head on his chest and listened to his steady breathing, and even asleep he still stroked her tenderly and put his arm around her waist. She was no longer tormented by conscience and doubts that she betrayed Daniel. Now she knew for sure that she would never find a better husband and father for Eduardo. The couple got married, Ignacio's parents welcomed Olala very well, and they enjoyed spending their weekends with Eduardo. They saw how their son blossomed and wanted to live next to this sweet, snub-nosed girl. He was just glowing from the inside, and Olala was taking such good care of him. Hot delicious dinner every day, a thermos of tea, 
and a big lunchbox in the morning, she was understanding, she tolerated the peculiarities of his work, and she did not scold him as his ex-wife. And the fact that she had a child was not a problem. His parents considered the boy their grandson and were ready to help raise him. But Ignacio had one last unresolved family matter. Ever since that heart-to-heart -heart talk in the park, he couldn't understand how it was possible that the biological grandparents didn't want to know their grandson. It's just so inhuman. But Olala flatly refused to talk about it. She was mortally offended and didn't want to talk to them ever again. They had insulted her for nothing, humiliated her, and did not support her at the most difficult time in her life. So her husband decided to talk to them himself without telling Olala. He did not know why he wanted to do this, but he decided it was worth trying. The next day after his shift, he went straight to their house. He was very worried and didn't know what to tell them. How to start a conversation. There was a picture of Eduardo in his pocket. The little boy was smiling in the picture, showing his only tooth that had come out from the bottom. Ignacio had expected to see pompous, arrogant, rich people because that was exactly how Olala had described them. When he rang the doorbell, a tired old woman with traces of her former beauty opened it. She looked at Ignacio questioningly. Hello. Are you looking for someone? The guy hesitated a little. He did not know how to begin the conversation. Hello, my name is Ignacio. I need to talk to you. May I come in? It's going to be a long conversation. He was afraid that they would slam the door in front of him right now. After all, not everyone would agree to let a stranger into the house. But to his surprise, the woman shrugged and said, Well, come on in. In the room, there was a persistent smell of medicines. An elderly man, covered with a blanket, was lying on a bed. A blood pressure monitor was next to him on the bedside table. He looked drained and sick. He asked weakly, Benedicta, do we have visitors? Who is it? She answered aloofly, I don't know yet, Salomon, let's find out why this young man came to us. Ignacio didn't waste any time and started with the main thing. I'm Olala's husband. Does that name mean anything to you? The old woman changed her face and answered angrily, Yes, it does. It is the viper that killed our son, Daniel. I hate her. Why did you come here? What do you want? The guy took a picture of Eduardo out of his pocket and handed it to the woman. And this is your grandson, Eduardo. He's six months old. Look closely, he looks so much like your son. I've seen his picture. It's still in our apartment. Olala doesn't know I came to see you. You can love Olala or you can hate her. But how could you give up on your grandson? I just don't understand. You have no heart. Think about what I said. We don't need anything from you. We're doing well with Olala. I just wanted to say that if you want to see your grandson, now is the best time. Goodbye. Oh, one more thing. Olala loved your son very much. You shouldn't talk about her like that. Ignacio abruptly turned and left. Now I understand why Olala didn't want to see them. Very unpleasant people. After Ignacio left, Salomon told his wife, Why are you doing this, Benedicta? I can't take it anymore. Look at the picture. He looks just like Daniel. His eyes and eyebrows. He looks just like him. How long do you and I have left in this world? What kind of life do we have after Daniel died? Just pills and shots. Maybe you should stop hating that poor girl. And really start communicating with your grandson? I'm tired of living like this, Benedicta. He turned to the wall and sobbed silently, covering his face with his hands. Benedicta knew that her hatred towards Olala was just a way to numb the pain of the loss of her only son. But how could she force herself to forgive Olala? And the boy was indeed a copy of Daniel. No DNA test was needed. A week later, someone knocked on Olala's door. Ignacio was at work. When she opened the door, she even recoiled in surprise. Daniel's parents were standing on the doorstep. Jesus, how did they find me? What do they want? Nothing good can come from these people, she thought. 
Salomon started first. Hello, Alala, may I come in? The hostess silently let the unpleasant visitors in. But she continued to stand in the corridor and looked at them questioningly. The man continued, I understand that you are not happy to see us. We were not nice to you. And we beg your forgiveness. We want to communicate with our grandson. May we? He's our only blood relative now. Benedicta walked to the playpen without waiting for Olala's answer. Eduardo was babbling something in his baby language, picking up his toys. She held out her hands to him and spoke. Hello, Eduardo. Look what Grandma brought you. Benedicta took soft multicolored cubes out of the bag and gave one to the child. He took it in his hands, began to examine it in amazement, and smiled, showing his only tooth. Suddenly the woman cried quietly, My God, he's Daniel's copy. His smile and the birthmark on his neck, just like Daniel's. Forgive me, Alala. I was wrong to think you were a slut. I really thought it was someone else's child, not Daniel's. Alala softened and suggested, let's go and have some tea. I made an apple pie. An hour later, they were having a friendly and peaceful conversation. Salomon was holding Eduardo on his lap, and he was twisting his grandfather's ear and laughing happily. When Ignacio came home in the evening, Olalo was telling him the news. Ignacio, can you imagine? Daniel's parents came to apologize. They want to communicate with Eduardo. And he immediately got attracted to them when he saw them as if he felt that they were his family. Isn't that great? I'm so happy that we made it up. My heart felt so good. Ignacio looked at his Olala with tenderness and thought, Great. So my plan worked. I had reached the heart of Salomon and Benedicta. And he said out loud, Dash C, that's wonderful. The grandparents came to their senses just in time. So now Eduardo has two grandmothers and two grandfathers. He hugged Olala and kissed her tenderly, feeling satisfied. It often happens in life, happiness is fleeting and can be replaced by grief or tragedy. It seems that life is over and there is no hope. But you have to believe that after darkness, light is sure to come and everything will play with other, new bright colors. The main thing is not to lose heart and remain a kind and sympathetic person, no matter what. And fate is sure to reward you for this. If you're enjoying it as well, Leave a like and subscribe to the channel.